Okay, so move on to our second speaker, Yang Ji Wang, who's going to talk about assessing ice rheology using physics informed deep learning. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to this early, early talk. So today I would like to talk about the discovery of the ice shelf rheology using deep learning techniques. So ice shelf is a flowing extension of grounded ice, which play a critical role in slowing ice discharge into the ocean. To predict its motions, besides the shadow shelf equations, we also need to know the effective ice viscosity, which is determined by the ice rheology. Ice rheology describes how ice deform in response to stress. A simple relation to describe the solid ice rheology is the Green's flow law, which has been widely used in ice sheet model. But however, the rheology of glacial ice could be much more complicated and it remains under debate. So using remote sensing data, prior studies based on windy theories claim that the power law of ice shelves is close to four instead of three. But however, such method can only be applied to the windy flow area, which is limited on the ice shelf. For 2D ice flow, the rheology is becoming hard to examine because the effective stress can no longer be determined explicitly. So to solve the problems, an alternative way is in fact to infer ice viscosity. And with the remote sensing data, viscosity becoming only a nose in the equation, which can be solved as an inverse problem. So prior inversion studies using different methods tends to infer the ice hardness and the Green's flow law. But however, here we aim to infer the viscosity via pins directly, avoiding any assumptions of power law dependence and allowing the data-driven discovering of the actual viscosity model. So here's, for example, showing the velocity thickness and the viscosity obtained from pins for emery ice shelves, which show a good accuracy. And from them, so we can directly get effective string rate and stress. And now we have the full information to examine the ice shelf rheology. So let's, let's first look at the stress string relations on two random locations on ice shelf. Unfortunately, none of them have a clear relations and also seem to follow different profile. So this means the ice shelf rheology could be much more complicated than what we thought. To better understanding how ice rheology evolves through the ice shelf, we decided to check the ice shelf, so, so the stress so the stress stream relations along a single flow lines, linking from upstream to downstreams. Now we see that follow the stream lines, the relation first follows a two to three lines and then gradually it turns into a vertical line. So what determines this turning point becoming a critical problem? To alter that, we calculate the along flow stream rate based on which the ice shelf can actually be divided into three regimes. When the stream rate is less than zero, it means the flow parcel at the front moves slower than that at the real, implying compression. And in opposite, when it is larger than zero, it refers to extension. We find that the turning points previously were matching the boundary of the compression zone. That means if we plot the data in the compression zone only, we see a clear power law relations. But however, on the other end, the data in the extension zone follow a vertical lines resembling perfect plastic rheology, which also imply that the classical power law description become invalid. So to confirm this finding is robust, let's do more analysis. So we first detect and analyze the compression zone on many other ice shelves surrounding Antarctica. All of, them all of them shows clear power law relations. And in addition, we find the power law exponent also follow clear patterns, which increase with stress. This naturally reminds us the well-known ice rheologies result from Goldsby and the Kostad, known as the composite rheology. In, a short form, in the short form, the composite rheologies describe that ice deformation is mainly governing by two mechanisms, green boundary sliding and a dislocation creep. Ice is not a single crystal ice, but consists of many tiny grains. And under relative low stress, so, the, so these grains start sliding against each other, resulting in deformation depending on the grain size. But however, when the stress become a little bit higher, the crystal lattice in the green size also falls to dislocate, resulting in another green size independent deformation. And from the data in the literature, most coefficient in the composite rheology can be obtained empirically. So the only unknowns in the expression is just the green size. So since the dislocation creep have no free parameter, let's first compare it with our data. We see that for the compression zone under low stress, the contribution of the, con of the dislocation creep almost negligible. But then if we compare the green boundary sliding terms with data, we show a good agreement as long as the inferred green size is around one millimeter. And such GBS dominated rheology was also found on other low stress compression zones on different ice shops, such as La Sensee and the Nascence, 
and with the inferred grain size are all around one millimeter. And in comparison, the compression zones near the bird eye stream on the Ross eye shaft experience higher stress. And we can see that the dislocation mechanisms start to taking effect at a high stress end. And if by fitting the entire compositoriology with data, we show a good match, and also the power exponent starts to increasing to three. And then at the end, on the next eye shaft, we find a compression zone, under, which is under even high stress. And with no surprise, we find that its rheology is governing by the dislocation creep mechanism itself. So, so far, we verify that the ice rheology in the compression zone does comply with the composite rheology. And we want to know that since the compression zone is going to the grounding ice, so its right quantification of its rheology is critical for predicting the grounding line flux as well as ice mass loss into the ocean. So now let's look at the extension zone. So compared to compression zones, the rheological behavior in the extension zone on different ice shops seems more complicated and less consistent. So to understand why, a key fact we find is that the inference error in the extension zone is always larger than that in the compression zone. And we have verified that such error is not due to data or the method, but actually is due to the contradiction between the model and the data. So to understand that, we recall that the classical shallow shelf equation is derived under the assumption of isotropic viscosity. But in that case, to inverse viscosity, we actually have two equations, but only one unknowns, which can cause the problems to be over-constrained. But however, to reduce the over-constraints, introducing a full anisotropic matrix is too much. However, here we want to do is just introduce, trying to introduce one, but only one more variable into our model to close the system. So consider the non-homogeneous structures and the crevasses in the vertical direction of ice shelves. A realistic assumption is that we're assuming the mean anisotropy of ice viscosity is actually happens in the vertical direction. And this will lead to the new anisotropic shallow shelf equation. So we can see that compared with the inference errors using isotropic viscosities, which have a larger inference errors and extension zone, the new errors using anisotropic viscosities is much less and uniform across the entire domains. And beside this mathematical justification, another physical reason that further convinced us that the inferred anisotropic viscosity is reasonable is that the horizontal viscosity pattern will capture the suture zone where the low viscosity is expected. Here we know that capturing the low viscosity pattern in the suture zone is important for predicting the rift propagations. As you can see here, the rift often terminated in the suture zone as the stress is hard to concentrate at the low viscosity region. But however, such matching cannot be observed from the isotropic viscosities. And the reason, as we mentioned before, is because of the larger inference errors due to the over constraints of the model. So here, finally, we want to show that the horizontal viscosity pattern, uh, we want to show the, all the horizontal viscosity pattern that we find for all the ice shop we have analyzed. And all of them matching the suture zone very well, consistent robustness of our result. And that's the end, the summary of my slide. So the three take home message for the, my talk is that we're thinking the rheology in the compression zone differs substantially with the compression zone. And in the compression zones, so the rheology follow power laws, obeying composite rheology. But however, in the extension zone, the power of big description becoming invalid, things the ice shop becoming inisotropic. But however, this discovery is just the beginning as there are a lot of physical interesting questions is waiting for us to answer. And that's the end of my talk. And thank you for your listening.